he just said, you know, don't you need much, just do it, go ahead, like, jump in. And that's what I tell students even now, like if ranging students are players or they were to class, just do it, just you know, do it. And if you make a mistake, you don't do that again. But no, don't do it again, you know? So you're gonna make mistakes, so who cares? Just do it. So, I mean, he's, he's really good. He was great at that. He just jumped in there. It was hard for him at the beginning with the label. It was very hard. And, uh, but he stuck it through. And, and, and of course, Hazel, of course, helped him out. And, you know, you see what happened all. Good guy, worked hard, had a good family. And he kept going, he kept straight ahead till the very end, till the very end. Well, the Newport Youth Band at, uh, was uh, supposedly, you know, had a lot of auditions from the East Coast of, you know, of the, of the U.S. And it was a lot of, tons of people auditioning, young players auditioning. Uh, it was started by Marshall Brown, who was my educator at the high school, actually, in Farmingdale High School. When he left there, he, he had got together with George Wing, had this concept. They got the funding, I believe, from the Laurelot family, which was to, uh, tobacco people. And it was from uh, the original Newport Jazz Festival. Larry was a very good big band drummer. And, uh, and also a small group player. <laughs> I know he studied with Charlie Persip at one point. And he and I probably on the band, were probably the close, pretty close friends uh, when we were on the band. Uh, he came over to my parents' house in Long Island, hung out, and I went to his parents' house in, in Jersey and hung out. After the band broke up, um, we kind of lost touch for a little while because I, then I, I was went on Maynard's band. I was playing. I started. Uh, first of all, I was playing with Don Ellis, and then I then I got on Maynard's band, and we kind of lost uh, communication there for a while. And I think at the time he might have gone to play with Andy Williams, which is where he met Grusin, I believe. And Dave was Dave was Andy's musical director at the time. So it was a stretch, a period where occasionally we would run into one another. And it was like, even if we didn't see one another for a while, it was like, if I saw it, it was like, we saw one another yesterday. There was no break in the action kind of a thing. He, one thing, even when Larry was, uh, was more or less still playing drums, I should say, very smart businessman. He was very, very bright, very bright. And he knew, his, I think he felt his calling was not to play drums, but to be, you know, get into the business end of it. And obviously, Thank God he did. You know, he, he was wonderful at it. And he had, for a time, he had a jingle company with this pianist, Shep Myers, who I'm not sure if he's still, he might have passed on, uh, called Duo Creatics. And I did a few, you know, a couple of things for him. I was doing a lot of studio work. That's what we kind of separated. I was doing a lot of studio work and lost, lost touch with Larry for a while. That His wife, Hazel, really helped out a lot because she was, I think she was a high school Spanish teacher. And she really, at one point, was you know, help, helping financially helping the situation out, and you know, great lady. But you know, Larry, when he started GRP, it was funny because uh, he really uh, he used to talk to my wife Gretchen, who's as you know my, my business partner and everything else, about me producing. And I said, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to produce. I don't know what to do. And my wife said, no, you better do. It. You're doing it. Kind of one of those things. You're doing it. So the first record I did with Larry for GRP was Digital Duke, which won a Grammy for Mercer Ellington at the time. So I really got into that whole thing and Larry was very supportive. He would uh, just give me the projects. Gretchen would put the, everything together and, uh, you know, budgets, sidemen, you know, everything. And we did a number of things, as you know, with, with Larry, with GRP. Uh, really smart businessman. What I, what, I, what I felt personally was that what Larry didn't know, he surrounded himself with people who did know and listened to them. You know, Duke Dubois, Bud Katzel, Mark Wexler, Andy Baltimore, I mean, you, could, you know, a number of people. Of course, Dave Bruson. And it was very smart. You know, as you know, a lot of people, when they get in a certain position, they figure they know it all. And, but Larry was very open-minded. Actually, he kind of let me run with it. And he let, actually, basically, Gretchen and I, we would do all the thing and then pr present what we had. And he'd say, you know, we got to go in and we mix this or we got to do this. But he, uh, I don't remember him like being visible in all the sessions, to be honest with you. You know, well, I would certainly keep him updated uh, as far as how the budget was going and musically. He said, well, how's everything going? I said, no, we're doing okay. And he says, okay, you know, let me know if there's a hassle. Or, you know, it was pretty cool. A, a pretty cool and loose, but still, you know, he was thinking. 
Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't like uh, goodbye and good luck. It was, he was really on, on top of it, but he just, he had a way of running the company that, you know, made you forget that he was the company. He also was an engineer. He's also quite a good engineer. So he, a lot of times he would, and, and when he started out, I think originally he was engineering the little the dates he was starting to do. And he, uh, well, it was funny because, you know, you do a, a, an LP, then you would do a cassette, and then you would do a CD. In those days, it was called a bonus track, you know. And then gradually, you know, Larry Sort, what no, I think what most other companies didn't see, the progress where, where this was all going, where vinyl would basically sort of become obsolete, cassettes would eventually become obsolete, and you're left with the CDs. I mean, he was, I think, the first one, really the heaviest guy in that market, and he got a lot of flack for it, too. From what I understand, a lot of people uh, thought, oh my God, it's like a passing fad, you know, what are you, you crazy? And, well, you know what happened. I mean, became, I mean, I mean uh, uh, the market was incredible. Now, all you, of course, now all you see is CDs. But Larry, I think, was one of the first guys to really promote it, but they thought he was crazy, and, oh, it's, vinyl's never gonna go, this is all gonna be this and that, and so. But he was smart. He just kept moving straight ahead. Well, I think, first of all, we had, I think they had a particular sound. Uh, they had the so-called GRP sound, which was things like, you know, with uh, Eric Marienthal and uh, uh, Valentin. They had a certain sound. They used to, they used to use the term smooth jazz, which I know Larry hated. Uh, it had that CD 101.9 sound, you know, uh, great stuff. I mean, I did stuff with uh, Eric and with... Uh, Oh my gosh, I can't think of the other alto player now. Great flute player and piccolo player too. Um, and uh, uh, he did a lot of those crossover things. And it, it, it just it hit the market at the right time too. And also the level was good. It wasn't just schlock. I mean, if you're talking about, if you want to use the term smooth jazz or crossover, it was, it was very well produced. The material was great and you had great players. You know, it wasn't just like uh, overnight successes. These were guys who were like tried and true players too like Eddie Daniels doing stuff like that in the Penthe, you know. Um, that was, I think it was just the level was was always hard with Larry. He had a great sense of humor and he loved to hang out and laugh and, you know, and it, he kind of stayed that way. He, he calmed down a little bit once he got into, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, after, uh, getting into dealing with the higher ups in the industry. But basically he was a very, very good guy and he, uh, he loved what he did. And uh, he worked hard at it, and he was fun to be around. But Larry, financially, of course, put his money where his mouth is. Well, I think that's right, it was it put his mouth where his money was. <laughs> it's one of those two. <laughs> but he really, as you know, he did a lot. He, he contributed a lot of money. Uh, and you also know there are people who can do those things, don't do them. So he, like I said, I really had to come in for him. When he, when he got the bread, he made the money, and he did it. He just went straight ahead. It wasn't like he retired in, in some Bahamian island or something or bought an island someplace and, and hung out, you know. So you have to come in for the guy.